Matthew 4.18. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. So the very first Sunday, or the first Sunday we started looking at people, we, I, I talked about Peter. He's the loud, I'm going to speak before I think, I'm going to act before I plan kind of personality guy. He's the loud, your loud college idiot type friend. Andrew, his brother, which, we, which I talked about last week, the exact opposite of his brother. Quiet, behind the scenes, he doesn't want to be on stage, he just wants to be uh, kind of working uh, where no one can kind of see him. And he is the opposite of his brother, kind of polar opposites. So they're two brothers. They own a fishing business together as brothers on the Sea of Galilee. Jesus saw Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting an end to the sea for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, down the shore, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. In the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left their boat and their father, and they followed him. James. Many of you will resonate with James this morning. Because James is a man of passion. However, James's passion is not always in the correct mode. We would also call that person a hothead. So if there's any hotheads out there, which is um, when things don't go kind of right or you're, you get up and you feel angry in the morning and the, first, the, the instant somebody does something wrong, cuts you off on the freeway, doesn't let you merge over, uh, the eggs are burned, your wife uh, yells at the dog or kicks a cat or whatever in the morning, whatever sets you off, all of a sudden, you are like Vesuvius. You are like a volcano that just goes, ah! and you just go crazy. You, call, you want to call down fire from heaven and burn everyone. Now, I know there's probably no hotheads in here like that, but if you know of one, you will say, hey, we preached about someone just like you on Sunday morning. We learned about someone just like you called James. And he was your quintessential hothead. This is going to be another aspect. If you are like that, then you will realize that even God can step into your life and use you. That even you, by your personality, by the weaknesses of your own personality, your first inclination is to get angry. Your first inclination is to throw plates across the room like, a, like you're in the Olympics or whatever and break things and slam doors and bust things off the hinges and kick the screen door down and throw the cat across the street, whatever, which I wouldn't mind, actually. But hey, <laughs> cats are meant to be thrown. Uh, you, in your makeup, you just are naturally kind of just always at the edge of doing something physical, and it's usually going to break something. You are going to find a friend in James, and we're going to take a look at his story this morning and how God uses James. Number one, the background, James the hothead, James the hothead, for any of us in here that, uh, that kind of live like that, that always live on the edge of like the minute somebody does something to me, man, I'm going to let them know how I feel. If I feel disrespected, if somebody does something wrong to me, man, they're going to know about it. I'm going to let them know verbally, physically, I'm going to tell them. That's who James was. James ran a fishing business on the Sea of Galilee with his brother John and their father Zebedee. They probably lived in Capernaum like Peter and Andrew and partnered with them in their fishing business together. And we see that in Luke 5, 7 through 10. Zebedee was a man of significant means as he was able to employ his own sons as well as multiple servants. I want you to look in Mark chapter 1. So turn uh, Matthew, Mark, it's the next book. Turn towards the back of your Bible. Mark chapter 1. This is really interesting because many times we think, oh, uh, the disciples, they were all really poor people. Uh, they were, you know, they weren't very... Um, There's no like middle class or upper class to the disciples. Actually, as we go along, you're going to see that Jesus grabs everybody. He grabs the rich guy. He grabs the middle class, hardworking guy. He grabs the lower class guy. He, inside of his disciples, his 12 that he's ultimately going to end up with, he has really people from every socioeconomic background. And and James and John, they come from a pretty well-to-do family. 
Zebedee owns his own fishing business, and he actually employs people. He's like kind of your small business owner that's doing really well. He's making, maybe in our society, six figures, half a million dollars. Uh, he's, he's doing well. Got his own boats, got his own guys to go out and fish for him. And James and John grow up in a pretty middle class, upper class uh, type of setup for their time. Look in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter, chapter 1 verse 20. Actually, I'll start in verse 18. So, so this is Mark telling the same story of, of James and John coming to know him. Verse 18. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. I want you to see something. It doesn't matter for many of us. If you grew up with a silver spoon in your mouth and mom and dad made a lot of money and they could buy you whatever you want, you always had the new iPhone or whatever uh, the latest gadget was. You had the new gizmo uh, for, uh, for Christmas. Mom and dad could always buy you what you wanted. They could always get you the thing you wanted. If you grew up in a scenario like that, maybe you're a little bit spoiled. Maybe you're a little bit like, hey, I get what, you know, if I, if I sit on dad's lap and tell daddy I love you, I can get whatever I want, whatever, and all the girls in here are going, uh-huh, I remember those days when I could sit on dad's lap, you know, when you're 9, 10, 11 years old and go, dad, I just, I really need those shoes. Okay, sweetie, we're not going to eat this month so that I can get you those shoes. You know, if you, had a, if you had a parent that always tried to do everything for you, that was somewhat similar to James and John's scenario. And we will see uh, John's story next week. But this week, we take a look at James, who's the oldest brother. He's the older brother of, of the James and John duo. And at being the oldest son, he would be the one who gets all the wealth should his dad Zebedee die. In their cultural scenario, I'm the oldest in my family, the oldest male in my family. If my dad dies, the business, the finances, everything falls to me. One, it falls to me that I get his money, but two, the business falls to me that I have to be able to run it. So James is actually in charge of the whole family clan, their finances. It's like when dad starts a business in his garage, like Apple or something, and it becomes huge. When the, when the owner, inventor, of Apple dies, technically his son would rise up and take the CEO position. And that's how the culture of the first century went if you were the oldest son. That's the scenario that James is in. But right here, he leaves his father, he leaves his fishing business to go follow Jesus. And I love this picture that here you have James, who's the oldest. Everybody looks to James in the family, like you, our, our whole hope of our family is set on your shoulders, James. And now James, the leader, goes, you know what, I'm going to follow Jesus for a while and see what Jesus is about. He leaves the hired servants. He leaves dad. He leaves business. He actually leaves his inheritance to go follow after Christ. Additionally, so Zebedee's wife, is, her name is Shalom, which is a, a, a different way of saying peace or shalom in, uh, in Hebrew. His wife's name, Zebedee's wife's name was Shalom, the mother of, of James and John. She often supported Jesus' ministry out of her wealth. And you see this in, in Mark 15 and in Luke 8. Uh, gentlemen, if you make a lot of money, you know that your wife controls a lot of that money, right? So even if even if the missus doesn't work, she still has a say oftentimes of what goes on with the money. Even our, even our legal system set up like that. So even if you want to say, I'm going to divorce my wife and you know, I made a, a billion dollars and I'm not going to give her any of it or whatever. Our legal system still says, hey, you know what? She had value while you were making a living. She took care of your kids. She took care of your house. She had a part-time job or whatever. You, you're not going to just leave her Stranded. You're not just going to leave her without any finances. So even our legal system, if you don't want to support your wife, they help you support your wife by taking from your paycheck, right? That's where, that's where even our legal system to this day works that way, right? And for those of us that have, have had our check garnished, we know what that's like. In this scenario, Zebedee, whose wife's name is Salome, she, when her son, when her two sons eventually, we'll see that next week, go start following Jesus, she takes some of the family money and starts supporting Jesus. She starts giving 
so that Jesus can teach her sons. She is supporting her son's ministry through the financial wealth that her and her husband have built. And you know what I like about that? I like that the fact that the family is involved in watching their sons get discipled and brought up. Because many times we think that money just kind of comes out of nowhere, that God kind of creates it from the clouds and it just kind of floats down to the church. Look, money from heaven. Jesus, you print money. You know where all God's money is? It's in your bank account. All of God's money is in your bank account. It just depends on what you're going to do with it. You can spend it all on yourself. But the point is it just dies with you then. The things that you just buy and stuff, that, when that car that you buy just gets rusty or you have to sell it or it breaks down or whatever, that, that, fi- that input that you put into your life is now gone. When you invest it into eternity, you will see results that you can't even fathom in this life. And watch this. We are preaching to, I'm preaching today on a young man whose ministry was supported by the finances of mom and dad. That if they had not put into Jesus' ministry so he could be free from having to work uh, a, a regular secular job so that he could just teach their sons, it's possible that their sons would have to have gone off and worked and not had to, the, the time to spend with Christ. So I want you to see something this morning. All ministry revolves around your giving. All ministry does. It doesn't come out of no man's land. It doesn't come from some super rich guy that just keeps funding the church. And you're like, where does all these things come from? How do we keep the lights on? Everything that happens, happens because of the generosity of God's people. If the people of God are not generous, God's work does not get done. Could God float money down? Totally. I wish he would. But you know what? He doesn't. Because he's already floated money down to you. And that's what we see in Salome. She gives out of their wealth so that her sons could be trained by Christ. James, who was probably the oldest, along with John, were the type of brothers to fight with one another and anyone else. Do you know guys like that? Or girls like that? They're fighters. They don't want to just sit down and talk and, and, and deal with things in a calm way. They just, they, the minute they have a, an argument with somebody, it's always fight. Fists up. It's not, let's sit down and talk. It's like, what? It's always, let's go to war instead of let's sit down and talk about this. Many of us in here maybe are like that, where we'd rather go to battle than be at peace. And that's James and John. I can imagine that James, any of you guys ever got in a fight with your brother or sister, if you have a brother or sister in here? Anybody got in a fist fight with their brother? Hopefully not your sister, but, and you got, okay. Okay, you're Hispanic, so yes, you got in a lot of fights. <laughs> so you, you I, I, Tony just r- rumbles over here, you know. You, you want to deal with Tony? He's, he's like the, he's the orchard heavy. You know, he's, he's going to take care of you if, you if there's problems up in here. So here's the thing. James and John, their brothers They're hardworking guys. They're fishermen, like I talked about with Peter and Andrew. Hard labor, hard labor. I mean, these guys are strong, working with their hands type strong, callous, big muscled men. And I can imagine if you're a big muscled guy and you're a hothead, you're the kind of guy that goes to LA Fitness just to pick a fight or whatever. You know, you go to Gold's Gym and lift, you know, pressing 400 pounds, you go, hey, seems like you're looking at me a little funny. You know, and you meet him out in the parking lot and go, hey, you got a problem? That kind of guy, you know, the roid guy, the roid head or whatever. Always looking to fight, never looking to build relationships. James and John, we see them as that kind of person. Apparently, because of their intense, boisterous personalities, they were nicknamed Sons of Thunder. Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> and it comes from the Greek word boerginus, which, which, means, which literally means sons of commotion, sons of chaos, sons of anarchy, if you watch that show. It's the, it's the idea that these are, these are brothers. Jesus gives the, the brothers a nickname that, that means like they're just always fighting. 
they're just, there's always an issue. They fight among one another. They're kind of picking fights here. James is the guy that's going to be in a fight. And even Jesus sees that in them. And Jesus nicknames the two brothers, James and John, the sons of thunder. The sons of a commotion. The sons of a, a rabble. Imagine if Jesus gave you that, name, that nickname. You know, you're hoping for Jesus for like some awesome nickname like son of righteousness. Holy man of God. You, the great one. He sits down with you and your brother and goes, you know what I'm going to nickname you guys? The sons of stinking thunder. Because you can't stop fighting. And imagine you talking to them and the two brothers just going, wow, I could have wished I would have got a better nickname than that, but I guess I have to take sons of thunder. And imagine they probably laughed about that. You know, Jesus has given them this, this kind of funky little nickname and all three of them are like, yeah, I guess we kind of are like that. Now watch actually what happens when Jesus actually starts to mold James. One time, when they were going south to Jerusalem from Galilee, Jesus sent his disciples to find lodging in a village in Samaria. Because the Samaritans hate the Jews and their worship at Jerusalem, they reject Jesus from staying there. James is so angry, he asked Jesus if he and John should call down fire from heaven and kill everyone like Elijah had done 900 years earlier. You got to see this in Luke. So go to the next book, so Matthew, Mark, Luke. This is what I'm talking about. This is just, this is crazy. So Jesus nicknames them the sons of thunder. Now we're going to see why Jesus nicknamed this. So we're going to get a little peek into the life of James this morning in, uh, in Luke chapter 9. Verse 56. Actually, we'll start in verse 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. So Jesus is up in Galilee. Watch this. So I'm going to do a little visual map. Jerusalem's here where the temple is, Okay. Samaria lies between Jerusalem and Galilee, Lake of Galilee is in northern Israel. This is where Jesus is on the lake up here in Capernaum with, with uh, um, James and John and Peter and Andrew. They have to go down to Jerusalem, okay? They could go way over here, they could go way by the, sea, the Mediterranean Sea, but they choose to go right through the middle. So Jesus, like a rabbi would normally do when he was going to go visit a place, he would send his associates ahead of him to prepare the way for him. So when they come up to a village, they go, hey, our rabbi's coming. Is there any way that you can provide us um, like a place to stay? Or could you give us some dinner? We got like 12 or 15 or 20 guys coming. And uh, we'd love to stay at your inn or stay at your home. If there's a rich person with a big upper room, we'd love to stay at your house. Can we stay there? And so the, the person would say, yes, that'd be great. Give me some time. I'll put together a meal for you guys. What happens when Jesus sends his disciples ahead, James and John and the rest of the guys, they go into the village and they go, hey, uh, Jesus is coming, we'd like, to, uh, we'd like to stay at your village. They go, are, are you guys heading to Jerusalem because you guys are Jews? Yeah. You guys aren't welcome here. We reject you out of our, why don't you just get out of our village? And so they tell this to James and John, get out of here. Get your Galilee butts up out of our Samaritan village. So James is like, oh, really? You can tell me to leave your village. So he like walks out and he walks to Jesus and this is the conversation they have, ready? But the people did not receive him because his face was set towards Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? <laughs> All right, let's stop. Let's stop for a second. Let's put this picture together in our minds, ready? Because we think of Jesus, you know, gentle and mild and hey, oh, oh, I have never worked a day in my life. I'm milky and I just, I live in a basement or whatever and just pray all day. Jesus is a real working man. He, he really walks around. He really, he does real things like a man does, okay? He's not some uh, milk toast Jesus like the paintings you have of like he's never seen a day of sun in his whole life or whatever, okay? With the perfect hair or whatever he's got going on there. But that's not the Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus of the Bible walked miles and miles and miles in the hot sun, did hard labor when he was younger. He's a real man's man, okay? 
when his hothead disciples, James and John, come back to him, they go, you know what, Jesus, we went to the Samaritan village. They don't even want you here. Should we call down fire from heaven and burn them all? <laughs> now watch this. What, you know what I love about what Jesus doesn't say? Watch this. Jesus doesn't say, what are you talking about? No one can do that. Jesus doesn't say that's impossible. Jesus doesn't say that that couldn't happen. Jesus just rebukes them because that's not his mission. His mission was not to kill people. His mission was to save people. So I love the fact that Jesus doesn't, doesn't go, what are you even talking about? Nobody can call down fire from heaven. He actually just rebukes them for, for the thought of wanting to kill them because they were, they were rejected. But he also doesn't say, you know what? I know you guys probably could do that. Elijah, who at about 900 years earlier, did call down fire from heaven in Samaria. And he had killed a uh, hundred guys. Armies came to try to arrest Elijah. Eli Elijah prays this to God. If I'm a man of God, then let fire fall from heaven and burn all these guys. It says fire fell from heaven and charred these armies that kept coming to try to arrest Elijah. And pretty soon the last, the last army guy's like, please, Elijah, don't kill me. And then God says, you're welcome to go with this, with this guy and, and, and speak to the king. There was precedence that God would send down fire from heaven for disrespect. And so James goes, hey, should we call down some fire? And I love that Jesus goes, shut up. Because it says he rebuked them and then they went on. They went on to another village. I love the fact that James was ready to call down fire. I mean, he would have just stood out in the, in the desert outside the village and gone, all right, here we go. Here we go. He's one of those guys. Men are all about honor and respect. Men will die for respect. If they don't feel respect from their wife, if they don't feel respect from their job, if they don't feel respect, uh, men don't function in disrespect. They have to have an outlet. They drink, they get high, they don't come home, they punch things. Uh, they have to, there's an outlet for men that, that, that when they're not respected. James, who's already a hothead, when he's not respected, I can just imagine him going, oh, 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 somebody's going to get charred up in here. Oh, you're going to kick me out of your village? We're going to see who the daddy really is around here. I'm going to call down some fire, and um, you're not going to be around to disrespect me again, son. Imagine that scenario. We think of the disciples as just like these kind of milk, milky guys that are just like, we just do whatever Jesus wants. James is like, oh, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus, oh, Jesus. You see what they said? We came to set up a, a room for you, and they said, no. They said, because you're a Jew, and we culturally, we hate you. Eth ethnically, we hate you. We don't want you to go to Jerusalem, so we're not even going to support your mission. You want me to charm for you, Jesus? I'll, I'll do it. I'm not scared, Jesus. I'll call down some fire right now. And Jesus says, hey, that's not my mission. And they went on to another village. Lucky for that village, James was not Jesus. <laughs> I mean, lucky for, for that village that James didn't have the power of Jesus to make that thing happen. Because that village would be charred to this day. That's the kind of man James was. Burn first, ask questions later. While Jesus probably appreciated his zeal to defend this disrespect, Jesus rebukes him and they go to another village. Even when he failed, Jesus tried to help James fail forward. And you know, that's one thing I really want to point out to you. And I love, I love uh, the Ching's testimony this morning. You're not going to do things right all the time. Even, especially before you come to Christ. You're going to screw up because all you're doing is trying to do what you think is right for the moment. And you're going to incur a lot of damage upon yourself. You're going to go, my marriage is so unhappy, I'm going to go find somebody that's going to make me happy. My job is so uh, revolting to me, I'm going to start stealing from it because I'm so angry about my employer. My, you know, I hate my house that, that I'm living in, and so I'm going to do this or that or the other thing. You're going to do things that you think make sense to you before you come to Christ, but what it actually does is you actually damage yourself so that eventually when you come to Jesus, you have to unpack all that garbage. 
you have to repair all the damage that you didn't even realize you were doing to yourself before you came to know Jesus. So God has to do recon work and, and, and start repairing you from the back end because of damage that you even did to yourself before you even came to know Jesus. But that's how good God is. God will take your damaged, broken self and build you up still. He will take the nasty part of your heart that you can't even get rid of, the, 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 the soot that, that lays inside of there that you can't get rid of, the anger and the bitterness, and he starts to mold it and make it soft and make something beautiful out of your life. And that's what God does with James. You will not do everything right. You will sin against God. But if you're repentant, God, like a good father, takes you back and cleans you up and makes you something great. You will never be great, but God can make you great for his glory. You will not be great in yourself, but you can be great with God's help. And I love that he does this with James. James, I'd much rather have a guy like James than a guy that never did anything. Those of us that own a business or something, we always love the guy that's trying to do something, that has some passion for it, rather than the guy that we have to like prod, like your, like your teenage son or daughter, to go do something. Will you please take out the trash? Now it's not please anymore. Go take out the trash right now. Oh, I'll get to it in 14 years or whatever. I want you to do it right now. It's that prodding. It's, it's like, man, if you had kids that were just like, how can I help? How can I help? How can I help? I mean, we've never even heard that in our homes, right? <laughs> You're like, what kind of kid are you talking about? You know, if, you, if your kid just got up in the morning and went, Mom, Dad, how can I help you? I appreciate everything you've done for me. I didn't buy these clothes. I don't, you know, I don't support this home. I didn't put, pay for the electric bill. So in, in the honor of you in my life, I just want to say, how can I help? I mean, we just have a heart attack, right? If, we, if our son just, our daughter started talking like that, our teenage son or daughter, we just go, oh, I can't breathe. I don't know. Who are you? How did you get in my house? I love the guys that if they're going to fail, they're going to fail at doing something moving forward. Not the guys that are just like, you always have to prod them. You ready now? You ready now? You ready now? James is the guy that you want on your team. Just like Richard Sherman for the Seahawks, he's going to say some stupid stuff once in a while. <laughs> he's going to say stuff that you see on SportsCenter and you go, as an owner, you just go, oh, wow. But you know what? On the field, he backs up his play. He backs up his mouth. Stop. No, stop. <laughs> I use him as an illustration, not because the Seahawks are awesome, okay? <laughs> now listen. You want a guy that if he's going to fail, he's going to fail forward. Not the guy that's going to fail and go, I give up. And I love that about James. He says some dumb things. He wants to do some dumb things. But man, I love that Jesus doesn't go, James, you're a lost cause. He takes James and all of his hothead glory and he, and he channels and funnels that energy towards righteousness. So for those of us that are hotheads, we're only hotheads because many times we don't get what we want or things aren't the way that we want them and they're not the way we want them right now. And so rather than handling them in a, in a proper way, we just blow up because we have all this extra energy of anger. Jesus wants to take that in you and make it righteous. Take all that extra energy, that latent energy that you just want to blow things up with and channel it for his glory. Because some of the greatest men of history, some of the greatest women of, of the kingdom have been hotheads. But the refining work of God took all that negative energy and made it positive for the kingdom. Number two, the follow me moment James leaves his fishing business. James leaves his fishing business. After James saw Jesus produce a miracle catch of fish, he left his father's business to become a fisher of men. Being the oldest son to leave the family business where he would be the owner at his father's death was a significant and potentially costly decision. For the next 18 months, despite his pride, arrogance, and personality that had to often be corralled by Jesus, he was used because of his go-getter intensity and entrepreneurial drive. Hey, there's some entrepreneurs in here. There's some guys that love to run their own business, some ladies that love to run their own business, and they're, they're willing to risk finances, spend hours and hours and hours making that thing happen. There's some entrepreneurs in here, and I want to bless you from the Lord that God has built you special, 
God has built you to do those things. God has built you with energy. God has built you with a mind to think how things can be put together. You're going to, fa- as an entrepreneur, you fail a lot. Edison, I think, I think he had like a thousand uh, incarnations of the light bulb before he came up with the right one. It's that intense, we, we benefit today from Edison's failures because he never gave up. He goes, it's almost there, it's almost there, this filament doesn't quite work, it's almost there, it's almost there, and all of a sudden, boom, we have light. To this day, we benefit from an entrepreneur, from a guy who was willing to sacrifice his time and his energy and his own money to make things happen. And there's some guys and and women in here like that. And I want to bless you this morning that God can use you for his glory. God can use your mind. God can use your energy as long as it's under his control. When you're living for God, anything you do can be used for his glory if you're willing to come under his control. And just like entrepreneurs, they don't want a boss. That's why they're entrepreneurs, right? They're basically bossless bosses. You don't want a boss, so you go, I can, I can do better than this, and you start it in your own garage or whatever. Hey, that's where Apple Computer came from, right? We benefit from somebody else's drive. But here's the thing. You don't want to use your own energy for your own glory. You want to con- be, be, be molded by the, the hand of God. And you can do something great for the kingdom of God. Even God can't steer a parked car James was always listed among the first three disciples, showing that he was one of the most influential and trusted confidants of Jesus. The goal of living should not be a long life, but rather a lasting influence. The follow me ending, how did James's life end? How did the hothead's life end? He ended his life by losing his head. James was beheaded. The follow me ending, James is beheaded. Before Jesus was crucified, he predicted James would be executed, and we see that in Mark 10, right at the very end. Um, James and John, they want to know who the greatest in the kingdom is. You ever had employees like that, or maybe you are that employee or, or, uh, or part of a company that you're like, how can I be the CEO? James and John were like that all the time. Right before Jesus is going to the cross, James and John are the ones like, hey, 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 Jesus, because they think he's going to set up the kingdom. He's, if this is right, we're, we get ready to celebrate it actually this, uh, this April. We're going to celebrate um, uh, when Jesus is going to enter Jerusalem and present himself as king right before uh, Easter, right before he dies. They think he's going into Jerusalem to set up his, his earthly kingdom. And so right before he gets ready to go into Jerusalem, they get together with Jesus and they're like, hey, would you mind if I sit at your right hand And my brother could sit at your left? Because those are the positions of power. If you're a king, those that sit at your right and your left are your second and third most powerful. So imagine James and John, the hothead brothers, going, hey, Jesus, let's not talk about it to any of the other disciples, but I want to let you know, Jesus, when you roll into Jerusalem as the Messiah, as the guy that's going to set up your kingdom, I, I got your back. It's me and you, Jesus, Ah, my brother too, but it's basically me and you. (laughs) Imagine James, he's the entrepreneur guy. He's the guy like, I see an opportunity, I'm going to grab it. James and John are recorded in the Bible as being the ones that go to Jesus and go, hey, we want to sit at your right and your left. How fantastic that we're brothers. And you have a right hand and you have a left hand and we could occupy each space. You can be the man, we'll be your helpers. If something happens to you, Jesus, we'll take over. We'll run the show, Jesus, if you die or whatever. They don't have a concept that Jesus is going to die for the sins of the world. They think he's going to set up his earthly kingdom, but they want a piece of it. But right then, Jesus says, you're going to drink the cup that I drink, which means I'm going to be executed, and James, you will be executed as well. Fourteen years later, James, who was now a church leader, was arrested by Herod Agrippa I and beheaded with a heavy-bladed sword around 44 AD. And we see that in Acts 12, uh, 1 through 3. Actually, James probably cried like that and, uh, when he was arrested. 
what we realize is that James, once he was arrested, knew it was a one-way ticket. Herod Agrippa arrested him. He was the first apostle to die. He was the first disciple to die. So the one that said, I want to sit at your right hand, Jesus, that same guy was the first one of everybody to die. And Jesus said to him, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? In other words, can you do what I'm going to do? And James and John said, yes, we can. And they thought what he meant at that moment was, are you going to be able to handle the pressure of running, running a, a kingdom? Like I can run it? And they're just like, yeah, I'm ready. But what Jesus meant was, I'm going to go die. Can you drink the same cup I'm going to drink? And James and John said, yes. And they didn't know what they were signing up for. 14 years later, James is arrested by Herod Agrippa. And Herod Agrippa puts him to death with the sword. And he was the first one to be martyred. He's the first disciple to die. So he didn't get the position of power. He actually had the position of execution. And to this day, he brings glory to God because of his character of wanting to always be on the front lines with Jesus. He was one of Jesus' closest confidants and he was the first one to give his life. And I, and I want to make this point to you and we close. Ready? Don't keep wishing that you're going to live to be an old, old man or an old lady. Pray to the Lord that your life has impact. Pray to the Lord that your life has impact because what good will it do for you to live to be 100 years old in some nursing home and you not have impacted anyone's life? Right? Watch this. I'm going to close. Ready? James, when he was called by Jesus at the beginning when, when we first started talking about when he was called as a fisherman, he was probably in his early 20s. He was probably in his early to mid-20s. Let's say he was 25. Jesus is about 33 at the time he dies. 14 years from 25 is 39. James was probably in his 30s when he gave his life. A, a, if you're old like me, he was a young man, right? Let's, let's look back to our 30s and go, I remember fondly those days. He's a pretty young man, but to this day we preach on his life because it had impact. He was a hothead, he said things wrong, he did things wrong, but guess what? When he came under the power of God, God used him greatly. And he gave his life for the Lord in his 30s. He didn't have a big business. He never got to go take Zebedee's fishing business. He gave his life. And Zebedee had to hand it off to someone else. Maybe he sold it. But his oldest, Zebedee's oldest son, James, gave his life for the greatness of the kingdom of God. And I pray that's true for all of us in here. That we're not just living to get old but we are living to do great things for the kingdom of God. Because at the end of our days, the things we've done for the kingdom of God are the only things that will matter.